The following lecture examines why the sketching rules we've been learning work. This material, while interesting, is entirely optional for this class. You go to your mechanical systems modeling class, hoping that something the instructor says will clear up all your confusion before the final exam. You had an all-nighter working on fluid mechanics, and now you're barely able to keep your eyes open. You find yourself drifting off to sleep. And then you had a really strange dream. In this dream, we'll examine why the frequency response rules that we studied previously work. Why the magnitude curve goes up or down depending upon whether a pole or a zero is at a particular frequency. To understand why these rules work, you have to see the following trick. We'll write the transfer function as g of s equals k times the product of s minus z1, s minus z2, through s minus zm, where z1, z2, and zm are the zeros of the transfer function, divided by the quantity s minus p1 times s minus p2 through s minus pn, where p1, p2, through pn are the poles of the transfer function. Then the frequency response of the transfer function, g of j omega, can also be written as the combination of terms in the numerator and the denominator, where we've taken s and replaced it by j omega. Now all these terms in the numerator and denominator are complex numbers, and so the magnitude and phase of g of j omega can be determined by using the product and quotient rules of complex numbers. Those product and quotient rules we studied in a previous lecture. Recall that to find the magnitude of a product of complex numbers, we simply need to find the magnitude of each complex number. And to find the magnitude of a ratio of complex numbers, we just need to find the magnitude of the numerator and the magnitude of the denominator, and then carry out the division. Of course, products and division, when we do a log-log plot, will appear as the addition of the logs. So this will make the determination of the magnitude of g of j omega even easier. Recall that for the phase of the product of complex numbers, we simply need to add the phases of each of the complex numbers together. To find the phase of a quotient of complex numbers, we simply find the phase of the numerator and subtract from it the phase of the denominator. So the phases won't present any problem either. We just need to figure out how each term in the numerator and denominator affects the magnitude and the phase of the transfer function, and then to combine all the effects together. In the remainder of this dream, we'll examine how left half plane poles, left half plane zeros, right half plane poles, and right half plane zeros affect the magnitude and phase curve of the transfer function. I think that after you examine this material carefully, you'll see the origin of the frequency response plot rules that we've been using. To start us off, we'll consider a system which has only a zero. So g of s will be equal to s minus z. Now, of course, this system is improper. We're only using this as a way to understand how a zero affects the frequency response. The zero in this case is at z on the real axis in the complex plane, and this value z may be either positive or negative. So if we want to find the frequency response, we'll replace s by j omega, where omega is the frequency of interest. And then g of j omega will be equal to j omega minus z. j omega minus z, of course, is a complex number, and so we can plot it in a complex plane. 
And if we want to find the magnitude of that complex number, we simply need to find the length of the vector that is j omega minus z in the complex plane. In the drawing that I am showing here, you'll note that I've drawn minus z as a positive number on the real axis. That means that z has to be a negative quantity to be directed in this fashion. If z is negative, that means that the zero is in the left half plane. Since the magnitude is the length of the vector, we can find this quite easily. So the magnitude of g of j omega is the magnitude of j omega minus z, which is the square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. And the real part is minus z, and the imaginary part is omega. So we find that the magnitude of g of j omega is square root of z squared plus omega squared. Of course, whether z is positive or negative will have no effect on the magnitude of g of j omega, since the magnitude of g of j omega is equal to the square root of omega squared plus z squared. And since z is being squared here, its length is only important, not its direction. However, its direction is important in the case of the phase, as we'll see in a moment. What about the phase of g of j omega? The phase of this complex number, phi, is the angle between the vector and the real axis, as shown in the diagram. And this phi will be equal to the inverse tangent of omega over minus z. Since omega is the imaginary part, and minus z is the real part. Now that we've found how the magnitude and phase are related to the frequency omega, let's now examine how the transfer functions, magnitude and phase, vary with frequency. We'll consider first small frequencies, frequencies much smaller than the absolute value of z. And that's shown in this diagram. You note that the real axis part, minus z, is much greater than the imaginary axis part. And I'm showing the vector for different values of omega, but in all cases, omega is small. And what you'll note is that the vector does change length, but it changes very slowly. And the length of this vector is essentially the absolute value of z, which is the DC gain of this transfer function. You can also see that the phase angle of g of j omega is positive, but very small. Note again that the case I've drawn here is when minus z is positive, and that corresponds to z being a negative number, which means that the zero is in the left half plane for the drawing indicated. Let's now consider the case of high frequency that is, frequency is much larger than the absolute value of z. In this case, our vector looks like as shown in the diagram. And you'll note that the imaginary part is much greater than the real part. So in this case, the magnitude of g of j omega is approximately the magnitude of omega. Since j omega, the imaginary part, is so much greater in length than the real part, and the phase of g of j omega will be approximately 90 degrees. Let's now consider the insights we just developed in a plot of the magnitude of g of j omega. At very low frequency, the magnitude is essentially constant with frequency and is equal to the DC gain, the absolute value of z. And at very high frequency, the magnitude will be increasing with omega. That will be a plus one slope on a log-log plot. Since we know the magnitude curve is continuous, these two behaviors, the low frequency behavior and the high frequency behavior, must join together in between. And so I've sketched that in here as well. There's a transition from the low frequency zero slope behavior to the high frequency plus one slope behavior. So this is what the magnitude plot looks like for the case of a zero in the left half plane. 
at frequencies much lower than that of the zero. We have a magnitude which is not changing with frequency. It has a slope of zero. And at frequencies much higher than that of the zero, we have a magnitude that is increasing with frequency, with a plus one slope on a log-log scale. We can also do the same sort of analysis for the phase curve. We saw that the phase at very low frequencies was approximately zero, although slightly positive, and that for very high frequencies it was 90 degrees. So we sketched these two behaviors, the low frequency and high frequency phase curve behaviors, here in this plot. And of course there's a transition region between these two. This transition occurring over plus and minus one decade around the frequency absolute value of z. This is the phase change that's introduced by a zero in the left half plane. We have an increase of 90 degrees. This increase taking place between plus and minus one decade of the absolute value of z. Now let's look at the case of the zero in the right half plane. For this case, we'll write our improper transfer function, g of s, as z minus s, and z will be greater than zero. The nice thing about writing the transfer function in this manner is that we've kept the dc gain as the absolute value of z, and we've kept the dc phase as zero degrees. So the dc gain and the low frequency phase are the same as we encountered for the previous example. The vector g of j omega in this case is as depicted in the figure at the bottom of the page. You'll note that the real part of this vector is z and the imaginary part is minus j omega. The magnitude here of the vector is the same as before, but the phase is different. For comparison in the lower left, I'm showing the slide where we discussed the case of a left half plane zero. You'll notice the vector in this case is pointing up and to the right, but in the case of the right half plane zero, shown in the lower right, the vector is pointing down and to the right. The phase of g of j omega with the zero in the right half plane is the negative of the phase of g of j omega with the zero in the left half plane. So let's summarize what we've learned for the case of a right half plane zero. The magnitude of z minus j omega with z greater than zero is the same as the magnitude of j omega minus z with z less than zero. These vectors have the same length. The length is always square root of z squared plus omega squared. The phase, however, is different. The phase of z minus j omega with z positive is the negative of the phase of j omega minus z with z negative. So what do these results imply for the magnitude and phase curves of g of j omega equals z minus j omega? with z greater than zero, that is, the case of a right half plane zero. Here we see the magnitude plot for the case of a right half plane zero. It shows the magnitude of the transfer function as a function of frequency omega. And you'll note this looks exactly like the case of a left half plane zero. At low frequency, the magnitude is constant, and at high frequency, it has an increasing value, the increase happening with a plus one slope on a log-log plot. The transition between these two regions of behavior occurs around the frequency, the absolute value of z. Recall that we just determined that the phase change for a system that is a right half plane zero was the opposite, the negative, of the phase change for a system with a left half plane zero. We previously determined the phase change for a left half plane zero. It was an increase of 90 degrees, happening around the frequency absolute value of z.
and that's shown here in the upper left. Simply taking the negative of this, we find the phase curve for the right half plane zero, shown in the lower right. So the phase change for a system that is a right half plane zero is minus 90 degrees. This change occurring between about one tenth the absolute value of z, where z is the frequency of the zero, to about 10 times the absolute value of z. So we've now tackled the case of a system with a single zero, either in the left half plane or the right half plane. So let's now turn our attention to a system with a single pole. So this system would be g of s equals 1 over s minus p. The pole in this case is at p on the real axis. And we'll start by assuming that p is less than 0, that is that this is a left half plane pole. And the transfer function of course in that case is stable. So we'll proceed in this case much like we did when we had a zero. We'll substitute in j omega for s, and that will give g of j omega equals one over j omega minus p. Of course, that's a complex number. Now I want you to note that one over g of j omega is equal to j omega minus p. And so one over g of j omega looks just like the left half plane zero case we were just looking at. So maybe we can figure out what the magnitude and the phase are doing from what we learned before in the case of a left half plane zero. And indeed we can. All we have to do is remember the facts that we learned when we studied the quotient rule for complex numbers. The important facts were that if we wanted to find the magnitude and phase of the ratio C1 over C2, all we need to do is find the magnitudes and the phases of C1 and C2, and then do the following. The magnitude of C1 over C2 is equal to the magnitude of C1 divided by the magnitude of C2. And the phase of C1 over C2 is the phase of C1 minus the phase of C2. So applying this to one over J omega minus P, we find that the magnitude of g of j omega is equal to 1 over the magnitude of j omega minus p. And the angle of g of j omega is equal to the negative of the angle of j omega minus p. The reason why is the numerator of this quotient is 1, and the denominator is j omega minus p. Now if we look at 1, it has a magnitude, of course, of 1. And the value 1 on the real axis has an angle that is 0. So that's the reason why the magnitude of g of j omega is equal to 1 over the magnitude of j omega minus p. And the angle of g of j omega is equal to the negative of the angle of j omega minus p. Now we know what the angle of j omega minus p is it will look much like the case of j omega minus z. So this shows that the magnitude for a system that consists of a left half plane pole is the inverse of the magnitude with a left half plane zero. And the phase of a system that is a left half plane pole is the negative of the phase of the system that's a left half plane zero. So we just saw that we could get the magnitude curve for the case of a left half plane pole from what we learned in the case of a left half plane zero. The magnitude will be the inverse of the left half plane zero case. In the upper right, I have the plot we previously obtained for a left half plane zero. And then I can derive from that the plot in the lower left, which is the change in magnitude for a left half plane pole. At low frequency, the magnitude will not change. And this is just like the case for the left half plane zero. Then at high frequency, the magnitude will decrease at a rate of minus one decade per decade. This is just the opposite of what happens in the case of a left half plane zero, where the magnitude increases at the rate of one decade per decade. That should make total sense because the magnitude here 
is 1 over the magnitude that we saw in the case of the left half plane 0. In between, of course, the low frequency and high frequency behavior, there will be a transition region. Let's now look at the phase curve for the case of a left half plane pole. We learned that the phase in this case is just the negative of the phase that we found with a left half plane zero. So in the upper right I have the phase with the left half plane zero and in the lower left I have the phase with the left half plane pole. You'll notice now that in the case of a left half plane pole we're going to get increasing phase lag with increasing frequency, a total of 90 degrees increase in phase lag between low frequency and high frequency. So the phase is shifting by minus 90 degrees. Of course for a pole in the right half plane the magnitude curve would look exactly the same as in the case of a pole in the left half plane. But the phase curve would look different just like in the case of zeros whether you're in the left half plane or the right half plane makes a large difference on the phase curve. The phase curve for a pole in the right half plane will be the opposite of the phase curve for a zero in the right half plane. If you recall, for a zero in the right half plane, the phase increasingly lagged. For a pole in the right half plane, the phase will increasingly lead. That is, for a pole in the right half plane, the phase will go from zero degrees to plus 90 degrees. I hope this dream makes clear to you the origin of the frequency response plot rules. Why each pole in zero affect the magnitude and phase curve as it does. That completes your dream. It's time to wake up.